Let's talk about intercooling. My answer to intercooling is always yes. Yes with pump gas, yes with race gas, yes with the 85, and even yes with water meth injection. Intercooling always makes power, except when it doesn't. Let's take a look at an example where a non-intercooled combination made more power than the intercooled version. In this video, we're running intercooled versus non-intercooled on a Vortex Supercharged 351. And it's my kind of 351 Windsor. It came from the wrecking yard and we upgraded and there's a whole video on that stuff. And I'll make sure to put a link up so you guys can check it out. But it's a good 351 and we ran it with a Vortex Supercharger like they all should have. But I also run Vortex after cooler, you know, the small little brick deal that they use on the five liter Ford. We ran it non-intercooled, we ran it with that after cooler, and we also run it with a bigger intercooler upgrade. And this was one example where the intercooler didn't make as much power. Check it out. Our test motor was a 351 Windsor or 5.8 liter that we got from the wrecking yard. It was a late model fuel injected version from a truck. And if you want to check out what we did to this thing, because what we did was got it from the wrecking yard, then we ran it on the dyno, upgraded it with an Edelbrock top end package that was carbureted, then swapped the carburation out for fuel injection. So it's a good video, and that video is already up. Check it out. It's right here. You can see what we did beforehand. But now, right now, we're starting with our uh, 351 Windsor in fuel injected form and we're going to run a vortex on it now we did that in the previous video but this time we're going to talk about the intercooling stuff and why sometimes an intercooler <laughs> doesn't make the power that it should so our 351 windsor was equipped with the edelbrock top end stuff and i'll go ahead and put the information up here but it had their aluminum 185 cnc cylinder heads it had an rpm 2 efi upper and lower intake their camshaft was a 573-582 lift split, 235-239 degree duration split, and 112 degree lobe separation angle. So it was a good combination, and obviously it worked well. It picked up a ton of power, especially in carbureted form. It, it made a little bit less in this fuel-injected form. But what we're going to do is take a look at a com couple of comparisons with uh, different kinds of intercooling on this deal. So run first, naturally aspirated, our... 351 Windsor produced 419 horsepower and 424 foot-pounds of torque. So now I'm going to show you what happened when we first installed a Vortex supercharger. This was a V3, um, you know, not a super powerful deal. And the first thing we did, we ran it non-intercooled and equipped it with a 3.6 inch pulley. So non-intercooled, just the discharge tube running out of the Vortex into the throttle body. So here's what happened when we ran the Vortec, and as we would expect, it picked up a ton of power. It went from 419 up to 559, and we're going to take a look at the boost curves on all of these combinations. So we did, after this, we did what everybody else does. We increased the boost. So we installed a 3.125 blower pulley, which speeds the blower up, makes it run faster. Faster blower relative to the motor adds boost. So here's what happened when we added boost. Peak power jumped up to 616 horsepower. And so we did, again, what everybody else does. We installed even more boost by putting an even smaller pulley on it. We went down to a 3-inch blower pulley and made even more power. You know, pretty typical. It wasn't a big jump from the 3.125 to the 3-inch. Bigger jump from the 3.6 to the 3.125. But equipped with the smallest pulley, this thing made 645 horsepower and 584 foot-pounds of torque. And remember, that's our junkyard motor, Edelbrock top-end kit, and the Vortex supercharger with no intercooler. So now let's take a look and see what happened when we ran a couple of intercoolers, and we can kind of compare those. After running a test with the non-intercooled configuration with the Vortex on our modified 351, we decided to run an intercooler. And the first thing I did was Vortex sells what they call an aftercooler, and it's a small air-to-water intercooler that they use for 5-liter Mustang applications. It's typically run on the smaller 5-liter, and as we'll see here, usually at lower power levels as well. But we installed this supercharger kit that was originally designed for a 5-liter Mustang. We put it on a 351 and made it work, because <laughs> that's what we do. And uh, we ran it at you know, a reasonably high power level, and in all honesty, it, it's more than that it, after cooler was designed for. But I wanted to see how well it did, and see what happened when we upgraded to a different intercooler, and you know, kind of see what happened. So we ran our, this is our naturally aspirated motor once again, our 351 with the Edelbrock stuff on it, which I, I like that Edelbrock package on this 351. It was like an impressive deal. 
419 horsepower. But here's what happened when we installed our our Vortex supercharger with the same 3-inch pulley, the smallest pulley that we ran on the non-intercooled combination. But this also had the aftercooler on it, the small air-to-water intercooler. So it produced over 600 horsepower, 607 horsepower. And we had uh, about 70 degree water running through the aftercooler. And I'm going to go ahead and show you both boost curves and charge temperature curves of these various combinations at the end of this. So right now we're just talking about the power. So this is what happened when we ran the 3 inch pulley and the aftercooler on our 351 or modified 351. So what I did was I started thinking, you know, this really does, isn't kind of making the power I think it should. So let's go ahead and replace that aftercooler with something bigger. So we had a, an air to water intercooler core that we used from the guys at CX Racing. It was a big single and we've used it at over a thousand horsepower. So we know that it was, you know, it could certainly flow more than enough for this kind of power level. So here's what happened when we installed the bigger aftercooler. And we made no change to the pulley or anything. The air fuel was the same. The timing was the same. There was no change because it wasn't, we weren't having the thing adjust based on charge temperature or anything. So here's what happened when we put the bigger intercooler on. We, we did indeed pick up power. Power was up to 626 horsepower and 577 foot pounds of torque. So all that is from basically an intercooler upgrade. So increased flow through the core. But as we'll see, um, even more happened with that. So let's take a look now at the boost curves generated by all these. But before we do that, I, I forgot one thing. I wanted to show you as a comparison. Here's the power output of the non-intercooled combination with this same pulley. So our non-intercooled combination actually made the most power. <laughs> The intercooled combination made a little bit better uh, power down here at four in, or down at 4,000 RPM. But out at the top, the non-intercooled version actually made more power than the intercooled version with the same air fuel, the same timing, and obviously the intercooled version had a much lower charge temperature, as we'll see. So let me know in the comments. Let me know what you guys think. Why is this so? Is this just strictly airflow? Now that we've taken a look at the power outputs of our supercharged Vortex Supercharge 351 with the small aftercooler, with the bigger air-to-water intercooler, and then with no intercooler at all, and we saw as we did that, we went up and up in power. Now let's see if we, we can find a correlation between the boost level for each one of those combinations and the power output. So this was our combination. This was our supercharged 351 with the three inch pulley. Now we did, didn't change the pulley for any of these tests, but it had the three inch pulley and the Vortec aftercooler, which basically is a small version of the air water intercooler. So run in this manner with the power output, and you can take a look at the, the last curve. You can see what, where we were with power. The boost rose from 2.8 pounds to a peak of 8.7 pounds at 6,100 RPM. So now let's take a look and see what happened to the boost curve after we upgraded to the larger air-to-water intercooler, the one that we used from CX Racing. So this is the bigger intercooler in red. As you can see, now the boost, it's important to note that the boost is measured um, not coming out of the supercharger. The boost is actually measured in the right after the throttle body in the intake manifold. So the boost increased in the intake manifold with the bigger intercooler, meaning it was less of a restriction than the smaller one. So the boost went up by about six tenths of a pound or so. Yeah. Yeah, so we saw an increase in boost and we saw a corresponding increase in power if we look at the power curves. So that kind of makes sense. Now let's take a look and see what happened when we installed the, uh, when we removed both intercoolers and just ran it non-intercooled with that same pulley. So again, the boost was up again, which, you know, <laughs> leads us to believe that there's a correlation between boost and power. But here's the other thing you need to think about is whenever we go to an intercooler from a non-intercooled application, obviously we're going to cool the charge temperature and that's going to drop the boost. Irrespective of the flow, if we lower the temperature, the boost is going to come down. And this is especially the case on a supercharged application where the speed of the supercharger is fixed. On a turbo application, the speed of the impeller is not fixed. If we regulate it with just boost, then it will spin a little bit faster to make 
the same boost under any of these test conditions. So it's a little bit different doing it with a turbo than a centrifugal supercharger. But there was an increase in boost for each one of these applications and an increase in power. So now let's take a look and see what happened to the charge temperature. Now that we've taken a look at the power and the boost pressure, let's take a look at the charge temperatures. We monitored the charge temperature the same place as the boost. We were monitoring charge temperature after the throttle body in the intake manifold, so definitely after the intercooler. Now here is the charge temperature curve on our uh, combination with the 3.6 pulley and the small Vortec aftercooler. We started out around 82 degrees and it rose to 104 degrees. And remember, that's after the intercooler, after cooler as they called it. Uh, it's also important to note that this was a fairly cold day. Actually, I was doing this test late at night, which happens often when I'm testing there. Uh, the, chart, the inlet air temperature, the ambient air temperature was about 65 degrees. So it was a nice day if you happen to be a, <laughs> if you happen to be a supercharger. So here's what happened when we upgraded to the larger air to water intercooler. Larger air to water intercooler is in red. And remember, they ran the same uh, amount of uh, water flow through them and the same temperature because we regulate that and monitor it through the dyno. So we just hooked up the, the water flow to the coolers and then run the valve at the same position. So we've got um, you know roughly the same temperature for the transfer medium, but we saw a big change, a big drop in temperature. So remember, we saw an increase in boost with the bigger intercooler so more boost was getting into the manifold and we saw lower charge temperature so normally that it would be the other way around if the if the boost is higher the temperature is higher so what that small intercooler does is both restricts the airflow and it's not it's and it's not cooling the air very well so it's not very efficiently sized for what we we're trying to do with it with as much power as we're trying to make. So it just needs to be run on a smaller application and then it will work well because it packages well right where they have it. But if you're trying to make power, you need to have the right size intercooler, whether that's an air to air or an air water. So for reference, we'll take a look and see what happens with no intercooler at all. And we could talk about that for a minute. So the green is no intercooler at all. We started off about 95 degrees. Because remember, this is this is this starting point is with the um, after the motor's been running for it might be three or four minutes or whatever, so that everything's up to temperature. And rose to a peak of 159 degrees. As if you can see from the the rise in temperature here, I mean we're talking about this is a 3,000 RPM spread. We run at 300 RPM per second, so this is basically a 10 second run on the dyno. Now, obviously, if you're out running around on the street. And especially if you get on the throttle really hard and race it up and then get off and then get back on the throttle, you're going to be starting with a much higher charge temperature, which is why I don't recommend not running intercoolers on these because the response rate is just not going to be good. You're going to, you're going to put a bunch of temperature in it and you're going to get off and then you're going to put a bunch more temperature in it. And so the starting point is going to be higher. The ending point is going to be higher. And we're also using a type K thermal couple. So I, we're not having a big change in temperature on the intercooled runs. So I think that it's probably fairly, fairly effective there, but we're seeing a big temperature change on the non-intercooled run. So I think if anything, the temperature here on the non-intercooled run probably is even higher than that. And it certainly would be, as I said, with multiple runs. So the, the moral of the story is run a intercooler and run a good, run an intercooler, and run a, run a good, efficient intercooler that's sized for the power output that you want. Let's get to our conclusion. Okay guys, what did you think about our test? Intercooled versus non-intercooled. Why did the non-intercooled piece make more power even after we upgraded to the bigger intercooler? Now I can understand going from the Vortec aftercooler, that thing really isn't sized for the kind of power level that we were testing at on our supercharged 351. That's more designed for a five liter Ford and it works pretty well in that application on the power outputs that we normally get on a mildly modified supercharged five liter. But on this 351, it was just undersized. So when we upgraded to the bigger intercooler, that worked out well, as expected. But with the same pulley, why did the non-intercooled version make more power than the intercooled version with the same air fuel and same timing even though it had higher charge temperature? Was it just flow? I mean, we've made 1200 horsepower with that single intercooler, so we know that it works and we know that it'll flow the air to make a lot of power. I just don't think it's that restrictive, but what do you guys think?
let me know in the comments. I'm Richard Holder, guys. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell. You know the, you know the drill. Let's do it all. Thanks for watching, guys.